We're going to get started. So welcome to workshop uh, 36, uh, Genetic and Cell-Based uh, Approaches to Cystic Fibrosis Therapy. Um, we're going to uh, uh, begin, and I'd like to encourage everyone to please silence your devices. Um, my name is Alejandro Petzulo from the University of Iowa, and it, is, it really is my pleasure to co-chair this session with Hillary Valley from uh, CF Foundation Labs. Um, I wanted to start uh, by saying that uh, cystic fibrosis therapeutic research has always been at the forefront of discovery. And um, it, 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 it is really exciting uh, that today we're going to um, see and listen to work from academia and industry uh, related to how to deliver uh, genes uh, um, uh, and, and, and how to edit the, the genome uh, in order to affect cellular function and hopefully cure all people with cystic fibrosis. Moreover, as is often the case with cystic fibrosis research, I think the implications of what we're going to see today go beyond cystic fibrosis itself to all of human disease, okay? So just a couple technical issues. Um, please um, uh, try to um, submit your questions uh, uh, through the Q&A if that's how you prefer to do it. So going to the session, workshop 36, and in the bottom, in the, you, you can select the Q&A. Additionally, we will also encourage everyone to ask questions live. We actually have two people that will go around with a microphone, okay? So I think that will be a great way to do to, to, to this more interactive. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Norman Allaire um, from the CF Foundation. Uh, if you can please come to the podium. So, all right, I'll just fold it here. Oh, perfect. Oh, do I have a pointer? Does this pointer work? Okay. I'll do it this way. Nope, it doesn't. Sorry. All right, let me just slide up here. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so everybody made it to the last session. I heard that we're gonna get gold stars on the way out from the, uh, from the conference. Um, my name is Norm Lair. I manage the genomics group at the foundation. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about our work looking at modulation of an Intron 22 alternative polydentylation event uh, site and how we think that has some benefit for certain three prime, three prime PTC variants. So I have nothing to disclose related to this presentation. So before I jump into the data, I just want to quick, quickly give you a little bit of background about why we're doing this project. So at the foundation, at the CFF lab, we, um, one of the focuses of the CFF lab is to find uh, mo uh, molecules to provide read-through for PTC variants. And over the last decade, there have been some sparse reports in the literature of some PTCs having a secondary impact on splicing. And so this is obviously a, a significant liability for some, this could be a significant liability for some PTCs. So from our standpoint, it was important to try to understand this more deeply. So that's how the whole project started. And so I'm showing you here is what we call an exon coverage plot. Um, and this is used a technique that we developed in the lab called enriched RNA-seq. And so the way enriched RNA-seq works is we create full length transcriptome wide cDNA. We chop it up into small bits and then we enrich with baits to um, CFTR, all 188 KB locus. And so what the, pur the purpose of this technique is it gives us very deep and unbiased coverage across the exons of CFTR. And so I'm showing you here are five um, uh, isogenic lines compared to the parental line. And on the, on the x-axis, we have exons 7 through 27. On the y-axis, we have the normalized count to wild type. And there's a lot of data here. I'm not going to go into the details, but I do want to draw your attention to the red boxes for um, R1162X and W12A2X. And this was a surprise to us. And what we found was that we see this drop in coverage between exons 22 and 23, and this suggests a truncation event. So we followed that up with three prime rays coupled to long read sequencing. And I'm showing you, what I'm showing you here is a W12A2X 16 HPs, but we also did this in R1162X. And what you can see is when you align the reads to the genome, 
On the five prime side of the exon, you see a nice clean alignment of the reeds, as you'd expect for a spliced reed. But on the three prime side of the boundary, you see an extension of the reeds into the intron. And then another unique feature of these, of these reeds is that we have a bunch of um, adenosine res residues that are, not, um, that are not in the genome. And so this is a classic poly tail. However, this is happening in the middle of intron 22, so we refer to this as an alternative polyadenylation event. And further evidence that this is an alternative polyadenylation event is when we look at the, um, the underlying sequence, we see an ATTAAA hexanucleotide followed by a dinucleotide cleavage CA 10 to 20 bases downstream. So what we have is we have a mRNA that contains exons 1 through, 23, 1 through 22, followed by about 140 base pairs of the intron. It codes for nine amino acids, plus followed by a stop, and then about 100, about 100 bases of an alternative UTR. Um, and this transcript, we would expect to escape ND for a W12A2X because it no longer carries the PTC. We also expect it to escape ND, NMD for our 1162X because it's in the effective last exon. So um, this gives rise to a protein of 1239 amino acids plus nine amino acids that's missing MBD2, and we expect this protein to have some partial function and to be, um, uh, we could stimulate with uh, 770. So we, um, we want to know if this is really true, that these transcripts are actually resistant to NMD. And so serendipitously, we had a cell line, which we call the I22 SAT line, which stands for splice acceptor disrupted line. And this line, this line was made to skip exon 23. And so the way it was designed was that they created a four base pair deletion in the intron in the splice acceptor. And this gives rise to at least three transcripts. The first one being a full length transcript carrying W12A2X. The second one being a skip transcript. And the third one being a truncation event. And so what we can do is we can use this cell line, do an actinomycin course, time course, and measure the um, half life. And when we do that, what you see is with a full length CFTR carrying the W12A2X, we have a very short half life. It was less than what we measured at two hours. And in fact, it's along the, along the, uh, or along the time of minutes. Um, and with our Exxon 22 truncated um, transcript, we're about four and a quarter hours. And so if we look at what the steady state levels are for that transcript, this was done in 16 HPEs. And in wild type, we see that this transcript naturally exists at about 5%. Um, in G542X, where the PTC is upstream and we don't expect this to escape NMD, we see it's also around 5%. In a missense, muta in a not, a missense mutation downstream, um, we see no change from wild type. But in the case of R1162X and, and W12A2X, we see an inflation. And when we convert, when we ask if this also happens in primary cells, the answer is yes. We see that in both HBEs and IOs. Okay, so this is our model. And so we have a nascent mRNA. In the case of W12A2X, we, with proper splicing, we create a full-length transcript that's under NMD. And then we have usage of an alternative polyadenylation event that gives rise to a truncated transcript that escapes NMD. So thinking about it from a therapeutic standpoint, we said, well, if we were to block um, exon 22-23 splicing, we should promote the use of the alternative polyadenylation site, and we should drive up levels of the transcript the truncated transcript. And so we worked with Hillary and our gene editing team, and she created a line for us that's gonna force the use of the alternative polydenylation event. And what she did was she, de she deleted exons 23 through 27, and below we have the desired edit. This contains all of intron uh, 22 with all its 11 polydenylation sites. And so if we look at the mRNA levels from, the, from wild type, um, full length, we have about 110,000 copies when normalized to some massive 40 nanograms of RNA. If we look at the truncated transcript, we see about 10%. This is very in line with what we normally see. But in our three clones that have that proper deletion, we see about a 12-fold increase in the truncated transcript. Okay. And if we run Westerns on the same three clones, I'll draw your attention to the, the last three line, the last three lanes. We have wild type, we have band B and band C. These are all plus and minus um, 445 and 661. We have an exon 22 truncated cDNA transfecting to hex cells. It gives us a, a truncated band B and band C. 
And then we have our three clones, and you can see that we're getting truncated BNP and BNC with all our clones. And lastly, if we um, run function on those, the tech assay, um, and the top four panels is with vehicle. And if we look at W1282X16 HPs, we see that we have no response with 770 as expected. But with our three clones, we see no force clone response as expected, but a, a nice response with 770. And if we do this in the background of 445 and 661, with W12A2X, we get a very small bump that's probably not therapeutically meaningful. Um, however, in our, um, in our three clones, we have this nice bump. And if you're a non-electrophysiologist like me, you can look at the left, uh, right panel, and you can see bar graphs, and this is in, in terms of percent wild type. Um, and you can see that we're getting somewhere between 16 and 25% wild type. And I don't have time to show the data, but if I take our best clone and we do a dose response with 70, 70, 770, we can drive that up to about 50%. Okay. So I'm not proposing that we're going to delete exons 23 through 27 from patients. I think I'd find a pink slip in my office from Martin on Monday if I had said that. Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to try to use ASOs to block splicing. And so we had done some exon, uh, some nucleotide walks to find optima, optimum ASOs to inhibit the splice donor splice acceptor side. And these are our SD18 and SAO8. And this is mRNA again. Um, the yellow bars are untreated. And you can see as trichapta has no effect, as you would expect. Um, and when we treat with SAO8, we see about a two-fold increase. When we treat with SD18, this is our splice donor, we see about we go up to about 60,000 copies. And then finally, when we treat the combination of our splice donor and splice acceptor and try to completely inhibit splicing, we get up to about 80,000 copies. Remember before I said 110,000 copies is what we think wild type full length levels are. So we're getting a nice effect in this. Um, this is work that was done by Jay Yoon in our group. Um, he ran Westerns on these, and he started by running a nice series of controls. Um, and I'm showing you these first. And this is a Western that is with uh, PNG ASF uh, deglycosylation. So we're now no longer looking at band B and band C. We're just looking at the length. And so if you look at our control lanes, we have wild type. We have the 23 skip. We have W1282X. And then we have exon 22. The last three are in cDNAs. And if we look at the effect um, in W1282X, our control line, our our w 12 w 12 a 2x um, uh, vehicle treated, you see a doublet, which represents the, the W1281 as well as the 1259 plus 8. Um, and when we treat with either SD18 or SD18 and SA8, plus and minus uh, 445 and 661, we see a reversion. So we're driving everything towards the truncation, and we're losing the 1281 bend. Okay. And so lastly, um, if we look at function, and we represent this as a percent wild type, and I'm not going to go into all the details, um, but if we look all the way to the left, what we see is where we take W12A2X cells, again, treated with our ASOs. Um, vehicle treated, we have, um, we have no response. If we have 445 and 661 in W12A2X, no ASOs, we have about 3%. And if you look all the way to the right, if you take those same W12A2X cells and just treat with our ASOs, we get about 2.3%. And then if you um, put that on top of Trikafta, you get about 13.4%. So in summary, um, we have identified a, a naturally occurring truncated mRNA um, at exon 22, and it results from the use of an alternative polydenylation event or site. Um, these uh, transcripts escape NMD for certain three prime variants, including R1162X, uh, W12A2X. And although we haven't tested it, we fully expect they'll escape NMD for all other three prime variants downstream of exon 22. Um, this, protein, this mRNA gives rise to a truncated protein missing MBD2. It's largely force gland insensitive. Um, however, it can be potentiated by 770. Um, and we've shown that inhibition of exon 22, 23 splicing whether we do that in a gene-edited model or with ASOs can increase the amount of truncated mRNA, um, the amount of truncated protein, and give rise to function. And so taken together, uh, we think that blockade of exon 22, 23 splicing may have some therapeutic benefit for th certain 3 prime CFTR uh, variants. And 
Okay, the most important slide. This is the acknowledgments, and um, so I'm standing here presenting data from our team. And so for all the people that actually did all the work here, um, and some of the people are in the audience here, I'd like to give a shout out to, to Matt Armstrong. He ran most of these assays, but to say he just ran the assays is really an understatement. He's a, a critical thinker. Um, he helped us analyze the data or, or think critically about the data, think critically about new, ex new experiments, designing new experiments. Um, Jay Yoon is a card-carrying electrophysiologist, which is a great compliment to a bunch of gene jockeys like ourselves. Um, so he really helps think, think about the protein, how that, how that works with, um, with modulating mRNA. Um, and Mercy Chatto is another member of the genomics team who wasn't able to be here today. Um, she's also a contributor to the project. My co-lead, Andrei Savichenko, um, he help, he's uh, been involved in this project from the beginning, help us critically think about, um, about the data and what, what new experiments to plan. And Josh Conte, who I think is also here, um, was responsible for doing a lot of the informatic analysis of the isoform, in, in the isoform, uh, of the isoform work. And then Hillary Valley, the gene editing team, I showed a very s small snapshot of some of the work that her team has done, but actually has a much larger body that helped us really understand how, this, how these APA sites are being modulated, and I didn't have time to get into that. Um, and Caitlin and her group for generating those, those results. And then look, um, lastly, electrophysiology group, as they say in that group, function is king. Um, that's kind of the trump card for everything. Um, so Yi ran all the experiments, and we had support from both Kevin and Herman for running these experiments. And then lastly, a special shout out to Martin. Um, this started as a, a very targeted question, asking something that was very relevant to what the lab was doing. And we quickly, once we answered that, we quickly pivoted and started thinking about it therapeutically. And he gave us a lot of, uh, he gave us a long leash and provided a lot of support to let us kind of pursue this. Um, and a lot of critical and thoughtful input on the design of the experiments. And the same is true with uh, Calcon. And I've got about 25 seconds to spare. Done. All right. Perfect timing. OK, so we have eight minutes for questions. Uh, I wanted to thank our two microphone runners. So if you have questions, please raise your hand, and they'll approach you. Um, while our audience comes up with questions, I wanted to ask you uh, one question. So uh, there's some really interesting data suggesting that um, people not classically thought to have uh, cystic fibrosis uh, uh, related mutations uh, or, or people with um, heterozygosity for some of these mutations may have increased incidence of some uh, phenotypes. Uh, for example, risk of bacterial infections and, and others, okay? Uh, it, what do we know about alternative poly polyadenylation uh, usage in the general population? And uh, could this uh, somehow have association with that risk in heterozygotes, for example? Yeah, I think that there's actually, there's actually a lot of work that's done on looking at, oh, I'm sorry, there's a lot of work that's being done um, on looking at the effect of alternative polyadenylation in human disease. A lot of it, you'll, see, you'll find a lot of the literature is based in cancer, where they're looking at the three prime UTR. Um, in the case of intronic alternative polydenylation, I know there's a, at least one case where somebody suggests modulating it for therapeutic benefit. Um, and I can't remember the disease off the top of my head. Um, but I think it's a largely unexplored area, or underexplored, I should say. And I think that there's things that we may, if we look closely, we may learn and we may find other applications for this. Thank you. Yeah. I don't see any questions, so I wanted to ask another question. So uh, um, often when we do um, RNA sequencing in library prep, uh, um, a lot of approaches are based on uh, using oligo uh, um, type of uh, capture um, uh, mechanism. Um, and you capture poly-A uh, um, related uh, uh, sequences. And uh, I'm not quite sure how normally one will account for alter alternative polyadenylation in an intronic manner. Uh, um, I wonder if some of this information is being discarded just because of the normal uh, uh, mechanism for, or process to analyze this type of data. So yeah. have you uh, uh, run into ways to, uh, uh, to analyze data to account for this? So. Um so I think that in, in general with our, our methods, if it's not polydentally, we're not going to see it, right? And so that's, that's clearly true. Um, 
In terms of capturing transcripts, and there are a group of transcripts, I think there are largely some link RNAs and some other small RNAs mm -hmm. um, that are non-poly adenylated. And I know that there are some methods are, 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 at sequencing those. They usually, they're largely based on size. But if we're talking about an unpoly adenylated large transcript, I actually don't know how we'd get after that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's ways that we think hard enough, but I'm sure there's ways we can attack it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we have a question over there. Um, so the slide about, that was really interesting. Oh, thank you. It's a naive question. The slide about the expression of these APAs in primary cells went by pretty quickly. Now, yep. a lot of people have measured, you know, CFGR mRNA in W1282X CF primary cells and really don't find much RNA. Is that because the probe sets don't detect these poly, this differentially polyadenylated species, or what? Um, I think the, the polyadenylation species, it's a rare species to begin with. It's only about 10%. Oh. Um, I think the, the reason why we found it um, was because we really went looking for it. Um, we, what I didn't tell you, what I didn't get a chance to go into was, we started this experiment by looking at predictive analysis of what, how PTCs could impact splicing. And R1162X and W12A2X were suggested to have the largest impact on splicing from a predictive standpoint. But when we ran our standard cDNA isoform protocol that tags on the three and five, five and three prime end, we didn't see anything. And I just didn't believe it. Um, and so that's when we moved into three prime race. We, we went to this experiment and we said, okay, there is something funny going on there. And then we followed that up with race and found the truncation event. So we really had to, it was based on some prior knowledge that we thought that there was something interesting going on there. But if you weren't looking for it, you probably wouldn't see it. Thank you. Sure. That was a great talk. I'm curious, just looking at this data, the thing that kind of stood out to me is, What's going on with R553X? Yeah. Why do you get this rebound? Yeah, so that's actually the reason why we all started this, and you can blame Hillary for this. She brought us a paper years ago um, that said that X, uh, R553X induced a cryptic uh, splice silencer that caused exon, 20, um, exon 12 skipping. And so that's what we were originally looking for. And then we said, well, why don't we expand it to all PTCs? Um, and so when we did this, what we, when we actually do this isoform sequencing on these cells, what we see is a, a large fraction of transcripts that skip exon 12, but also carry exons 12 through 15, and we see this big dip. And we also see that in R5, uh, G542X, but that's probably associated with nonsense, associated skipping rather than a clear, a clear splicing defect like, um, like R553X. And uh, one more question about like just SNPs in that intron that of all the sequencing you've done, have you ever seen SNPs that affect that APA site? Um, we not in this. A lot of the work that we've done has been in um, the 16HBE line. So in the 16HBE line, no. But is there, is there SNPs out in the wild? We haven't looked at that, but it's a good question. Yeah. What about smug sex cleavage like right at the PTC and then? degradation of the transcript right around the PTC? Would that not a, account for any, the G542X drop and the R11, R553X drop and both of the R1162X and W1282X? Yeah, it's a good At those exons, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, um, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. Um, I think that in the, in the case of R553X, the fact that it creates a cryptic splice silencer um, suggests, I think what you're referring to is the nonsense associated skipping which is certainly an issue, and I think that's probably more the issue with G542X. But with R553X, I think we have real evidence, or real, it suggests that there's something more than just, um, just degradation going on. But it's I'll, a really, really good question. Also, like, we always see a truncated W1282X band that kind of stabilizes upon, like, read-through yep. drug addition. Yep. Do you think that's that alternatively polyadenylated form? I think that there, I think that when we see truncated transcript in W1282X, we're probably seeing, um, we're probably seeing something like this, and we're probably it's it may be two bands that we're we're thinking are one, or sometimes we might think they're band B and band C prime, um, but I think that what we're actually looking at is actually a truncated in the W1281.
Can you please repeat your question? No, it was not a question. I was just co commenting. So I think you stabilize actually both products because with read through agents, you will have some successful pioneer rounds of translation. So that would also stabilize the full length transcript. But that in subsequent rounds will still give rise to the truncated protein uh, right. with the stop, right? So yeah, I think you get both really yeah. in the end. Yeah. yeah. OK. Sure. We've run out of time. Thank you very much for uh, a great thanks presentation. For your attention, everyone. Um, next up, we have Efrat Ozeri Galai um, from Splice Sense, who will be continuing our ASO theme, um, but will be telling us about ASOs for the 3849 plus 10KB C2T splicing defect. Thanks, Larry. Really. Um, and I want to thank the chairs and organizers for inviting me to tell you about the SPL84 Splice Sense first program for. Um, for cystic fibrosis, and really this is a really exciting times at Splicense, and actually for me personally, as I had the privilege to see this project go from an, an idea and a bench product at the lab of Professor Bacheva Kerem to reaching these days first in human clinical studies. Sure, sorry. This is the important part. So uh, we've heard about a lot about ancestral genucleotides and a different point of action uh, during the plenary, but I just repeat, um, the tantacyclinonucleotides are really short, single-stranded RNA molecules that bind specifically to the target RNA and can modulate it. They can act by three different modes of actions. They can either decrease the production of target proteins, they can restore protein function, or uh, modulate the RNA in order to produce modified uh, proteins. We at Splicens are using all of these modes of actions in our different programs. Uh, four modalities drive Splicens as a platform technology company. The first one is our robust genetic and clinical understanding of pulmonary diseases and cystic fibrosis, as well as our deep uh, understanding of splicing uh, mechanisms and factors that actually stems from uh, our scientific uh, founder, Professor Bocheva Karim, was part of the team that, that found the CFTR gene 30 years ago. Um, using this know-how, we, we are uh, finding target RNA targets for different pulmonary indications, and uh, for these targets, we are designing oligonucleotide using our in-house uh, computational algorithms that are optimizing different characteristics uh, of ancestral oligonucleotide, including the efficient binding uh, to, to our targets, masking of splicing elements, as well as avoiding off-targets and immunity effects. Um, we then select our lead candidates using our in vitro and in vivo model systems, um, and uh, they are delivered into the, in, in, to the patients using an inhaled delivery system. Uh, Splicense has a diverse pipeline, including four different indications uh, within our programs uh, within the CF uh, in different uh, stages of the development. As you can see, the, our most pro progressed program is SPL84, entering clinical studies. The second most progressed is SPL23, which actually um, induces exon 23 skipping, as we, uh, similar to what we just saw uh, in the previous presentation. And we have additional two indications. We have uh, additional indications for more large pulmonary indications. Uh, such as mucoobstructive diseases and IPF. So today I'll concentrate on SPL84. It is an antisysoligonucleotide drug uh, for patients carrying the 3849 mutation, and there are approximately 1,500 patients carrying 3849 mutation in the US and in Europe. Uh, in the US, the FDA approved two modulator drugs for this mutation, Kaleidico and Sindeco. However, both of them show limited improvement of lung function in patients, in the 3849 patients, of course. Um, and in fact, in Europe, when considering uh, the cost versus the effect uh, of these drugs, uh, these drugs were not approved for uh, 3849 mutation. So SPL84 is intended to uh, provide an efficient treatment specifically for 3849. And how does it work? 3849 mutation is actually a base substitution mutation within intron 22, leading to the inclusion of a cryptic uh, exon that includes a PTC. This leads to either degradation of the RNA or to the formation of a non-functional uh, CFGR protein. SPL84 binds uh, specifically to the cryptic exon uh, region and by this induce skipping over the cryptic exon and actually produce a completely wild type full length uh, mRNA and a fully functional CFGR protein um, that can potentially hopefully provide a cure for the lung function in uh, patients carrying 3849 mutation. We've done an extensive work 
uh, to characterize the effect of SPL84 in, in primary cells from patients, both HNE and and HB cells were analyzed. This was done in collaboration with the lab of Professor Isabel Sermet. Uh, we, uh, the cells were analyzed using, of course, the Usink chamber. We can see results from a homozygote patient, HB cells from a homozygote patient for the 3849 mutation. As we can see here, um, uh, we start from a low basal activity and following treatment, and this is free uptake of SPL84 uh, to the primary cells. We reach levels, full restoration, and levels of wild type CFTR activity. And interestingly, uh, when we treat the cells with SIMDECO, which is the available modulator drug for this patient population, we see no effect um, on CFTR activity, and this is in correlation to what we know is happening in the clinic. And we went on to analyze cells from heterozygote patients. Uh, as you can see here, there, I'll just say that in heterozygous patients, since we have only one 3849 allele, we can reach 50% of wild type CFTR activity. Um, and what, what we, you can see here is that we sampled five different uh, heterozygote patients uh, for H and E cells. They're, they have different uh, uh, mutations on the second allele. And in all of them, we, we saw full restoration of the CFTR activity, reaching an average of over 40% of, uh, of wild type. And this was seen also in HB cells from heterozygote patients. When we think about heterozygote patients that are heterozygote for 3849 over FIO uh, the approved drug for this patient would be Trikafta, and we all know that it's very efficient for treatment of the f 5 dl mutation. So we tested what would be the combinational effect of both drugs together. What we could see is that first, when we treat with Trikafta or SPL84 alone, both of them lead to, to a restoration of CFTR activity in comparable levels, approximately in this patient, 40% of wild type. But when we combine uh, both drugs together, we reached a, a higher effect, reaching almost 70% of wild type, indicating that they have an additive effect. And that may, be, may, uh, may, lead, may, may indicate of a potential additional benefit in this patient population from the combinational treatment compared to Trikafta alone. Finally, uh, we looked at uh, cells from a healthy volunteer. And as you can see here, when we treated the cells with SPL84, we saw no change in RNA or in, or in CFTR activity, indicating that the effect of SPL84 is specific uh, for the 3849 mutated CFTR. One major challenge uh, in antisense oligon in inhaled antisense oligonucleotide is actually the delivery, efficient delivery into the lungs and into the epithelial cells. And we did uh, some work in order to, to show that uh, our antisense oligonucleotide can be delivered efficiently, uh, first in mice. You can see here wild type mice treated with intratracheally with SPL84, uh, and then the lungs were um, stained with in situ hybridization with a specific probe for SPL84. Uh, we can see the negative control is clear. The wild type mice showing the, the dark staining ansys oligonucleotide along the entire lung. And what we found is that the ansys oligonucleotide is also stable and persistent in the lungs of the mice for at least four weeks following a single administration of the ansys oligonucleotide. Uh, this actually supports what we chose to, uh, that this ancestral can be administered even once weekly or even once in every two weeks uh, into patients. Um, of course, we all know that the CF uh, patients have a thick layer of mucus along the airways, so we wanted to analyze whether and the antisense can penetrate this thick mucus layer. Uh, with, with us, this the analysis in beta enoch mice that uh, has uh, CF-like uh, mucus layers along the airways. And as you can see here in this um, whole lung image, we can see that the antisense also in, uh, in the beta enoch mice is distributed along the entire lung. When we look at a higher uh, magnitude picture, we can see that the antisense distributes similarly in a comparable manner in beta enoch mice and in the wild type mice reaching the, the epithelial surface in trachea, bronchi, up to the bronchioles and the distal alveoli, indicating that indeed the mucus layer is not, or the antisense penetrates uh, the mucus layer. Um, when we labeled antisense oligonucleotide with the fluorescently labeling, we could show that the, antisense, that the antisense penetrates into the cell and into the nucleus where it needs to act. Um, we did an important study in, in monkeys. The monkeys were treated with actual inhalation of the antisense oligonucleotide, four weekly doses uh, of SPL84 when given to the monkeys, following by the same analysis when in situ hybridization with a specific probe. We can see that the antisense um, is distributed along the entire lung from the proximal to the distal regions, and the higher magnitude images could show that the 
uh, it penetrates into the epithelial cells from the bronchus to the bronchioles and up to the distal alveoli. And this very nice uh, large, large uh, magnitude image could indicate that the antisense is also entering into different types of epithelial cells, uh, including the uh, secretory cells, which we heard a lot about uh, during this conference, as, and the uh, ciliated cells. So overall, our uh, analysis in mice and in monkeys could demonstrate that antisense oligonucleotide, when given by inhalation, can uh, be distributed along the entire lungs, can penetrate the CF-like mucus, and is entering into different types of epithelial cells and even into uh, the nucleus where it needs to act. Uh, we have now successfully in Splicense uh, completed a nine-week uh, <coughs> toxicology study and safety pharmacology studies. Our nine-week toxicology studies found that the NOEL was at the highest test doses in both mice and in monkeys. We also did, as part of these studies, a pharmacokinetic analysis that shows the, that the uh, systemic exposure, that the antisense has a very low but dose-dependent systemic exposure, and that there is no accumulation of the antisense oligonucleotide post-treatment. Uh, and these uh, studies support uh, initiation in, of, of phase one, two studies. Um, and this is the, the plan for our phase one, two studies. It's composed of two parts. Part one is a classical safety study in healthy volunteers uh, receiving ascending doses of the antisense oligonucleotide. And the part B will be done in 3849 uh, patients that we were treated with <clears throat> eight weeks of SPL84, uh, either once weekly or once in every two weeks. And in this part of the study, uh, in addition to the safety analysis, we will also analyze the improvement uh, uh, in lung function in the patients. So to summarize, overall, uh, Splicense really is a platform technology company developing antisense oligonucleotide uh, for pulmonary therapies. We have a robust inhalation approach. We showed that the antisense has, shows proper penetration, migration, and stability uh, in mucus. We have a diverse pipeline from orphan indications uh, to mutant indications. And as, as I said very excitingly, our first program uh, is entering clinical studies these, day, these days, and our second program is aimed to enter clinical studies in 2023. Thank you, and I have a lot of time. So. <laughs> Thank you, Efrat. Um, just a reminder, if the audience has questions, you can just raise your hand. Let me see if we have any online. In the meantime, I think I will start with one. Um, I don't remember if it was for 3849 um, plus 10 KB specifically, but I do remember Batshiva showing at one point really dramatic variability in the levels of aberrant splicing in some of these CF patients that have splice mutations. So in terms of the amount that's splicing, like using the cryptic splice site versus the amount that might actually be, be producing um, wild type splice CFTR. And I was wondering if you saw any relationship between how much natural splicing the patients have and how much their response was. I mean, your, your error bars looked quite good in the HBE studies, but you know, do patients that have, um, or, or I guess in this case, cells um, that have less wild type splicing, are those the ones that are responding um, more to the ASO, or, or do you have any insights into that? Uh, yeah, so actually, you're right. That for 3849 patients, they do have a variability in the, the baseline level of wild type versus uh, yeah. cryptic uh, splicing. It might be the small numbers, but we didn't see um, a, a correlation or something that indicate. But actually, most of the all of the cells that we we sampled and took showed really high effect of the antisense, and they, they didn't have a really high uh, baseline activity to start with. So, okay, yeah, yeah, thanks, Kate. Thank you, and beautiful work, and really, really exciting for all the things that are coming into the pipeline. Your first study is in healthy volunteers. Is that with the CF ASO, or is that uh, just with a generic one? No, I'm, with, I'm the not sure with the CF With the it, specific SPL84 ASO, yeah. And the idea of going into healthy volunteers first is just for safety, and then you would move in. And, and how, many, how many people have this mutation? So as I said, in, in U.S. and Europe at least, uh, there are 1,500 patients 1500. having this mutation. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I, my, my second question, if I could, is, is the dark staining, you may mm -hmm. have said it. How, how do you get that staining? Yeah, so this is in situ hybridization. It just, we, we have a specific probe. It actually is a sense sequence that binds specifically to our antisense oligonucleotide and detects it. 
Hello, thank you for a nice presentation. Um, I might have missed this, but is this um, oligonucleotide delivered as naked DNA, or yeah. is it formulated into no, some right. lipid so component? Maybe I didn't uh, explain that. Yeah, so basically all uncis oligonucleotide drugs, uh, I, I, I might say that it's very different from sRNA or from long RNA molecules. There are short, approximately 20 nucleotide length, single-stranded, uh, uh, which are chemically modified, and they're just uh, delivered in cell line. Simple formulation of cell line, yeah. So uh, my question is kind of tied to the previous talk as well. Um, so with this particular splice variant, which is an intron 22, it causes a pseudo exon inclusion which will result in the termination of the transcript in intron 22. So the previous talk has talked about the stabilization of the transcript, which is in intron 22. So if you have to study these individuals with this particular splice variant, do you expect more of that transcript coming up, what the previous presenter has talked about, that they will have a transcript that is in intron 22 and will have more of those polyadenylations. With the polyadenylations. Because exactly that is a naturally occurring variant and you should exploit on those. Yeah. I think previous uh, one will be very interested to look into those individuals. Yeah, so I can answer from our perspective that uh, just, I don't know if it's very frequent as when we tested the effect of, I said Sindeco, that is a correct interpretation, we didn't see significant effect uh, in, in the 3849 patients, so I would think that it's not a common or very strong uh, effect of polyadenylation, but I don't know if you looked at it in the CFF labs. Yeah, um, just to chime in for a second. Um, so in the case of 3849 plus 10 KBCT, that creates a cryptic splice site, which causes a intron, a uh, cryptic X intron, and that's on the very um, three prime side of intron 22. What we're activating are APA sites that are in the very five prime of intron 22. I think that they're pretty. I think the two events are pretty pretty different from one another. Great presentation, thank you. Um, I wonder whether you can comment on the immune response, which is associated to the delivery with the delivery of the antisense um, single doses or maybe multiple dose um, administrations? So I'll start in Gilly if you want to, to add. Um, you can, okay, so I'll just start by saying that um, first, just for general antisense oligonucleotide, that they can induce immunity. So I think it's a different question, but I'll just say that we checked that and that, that specific sequence of antisense oligonucleotide is not um, um, causing uh, immunity or does not uh, influence on the uh, TLR9 or 8 uh, receptors, but um, uh, in, the, in the talk studies that were um, the ancestral oligonucleotide were found to be uh, safe, but uh, did uh, induce the common uh, uh, immune response that can, that it is induced by in any inhaled drug, but Gilly could maybe. Yeah, so maybe I can add. Emphasize. I think in general, when thinking about inhaled drugs, you might see some uptake by macrophages, which is the general natural process of clearance. I think that I would say the, the novelty of our approach as opposed to other companies that try to develop antisense oligo, for example, for kind of a, a lowering or trying to shut down the expression of beta enoch, so as an example, is that we really give very low doses and less frequent administrations, as Efrat indicated. We are targeting at the weekly or every other, other week regimen. And the beauty of having a full length wild type CFTR enables us to give very low doses, as you probably all know better than I, that you don't need a lot of CFTR, full length RNA, to generate a significant change uh, potentially in the lung function. So we use those two and combine them. And considering our nine weeks talk, talk studies, studies, which were really clean, we are quite comfortable moving forward into patients. I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was really impressed by the widespread delivery, uh, even in the context of 
um, what occurs inside the lungs of the beta in neck mouse. Um, I was wondering if you've uh, considered doing some testing in other models of airway inflammation, perhaps more uh, type 2 uh, directed inflammation versus uh, uh, other models that may result in mucins, uh, different mucin composition in what ends up obstructing the airways. Yeah, so we haven't done this yet. Uh, actually, the, the, when we tested the mucus, we tested both um, in vivo, in the beta-inoc mice. We did test the stability of ancestral nucleus when it was incubated in vitro with uh, sputum samples from CF patients in order to see that it's stable. It was very stable. Uh, over time, and we also did in vitro analysis of migration of the antisocialic nucleotide uh, through mucus to show that it migrates freely, um, and all of these data together, uh, we use it to, to show that it's stable and can migrate through the mucus. Yeah. Very nice talk, thank you. Naive question, did you try IV delivery to see if you could target other organs? Um, no, so we actually are concentrating in, uh, in inhaled delivery, and the concept is that we want to reach the target organ, in this case, uh, or the most permanent that we want to reach, the lungs, um, because for instance, uh, delivering it by IV it can be problematic if you are reaching uh, high doses in order to, to reach the, all the organs or to have a spread, or to, of course, if you want to reach the lungs with an IV uh, it would, it would uh, require high doses, and, and that's, that's exactly what we wanted to avoid by administering it specifically by inhalations to the lungs. Uh, for the doses you're using, what's the nebulization time, the treatment time? I think, oh, yeah, Gilly. <laughs> chemical modification is actually that the formulation is straightforward, solubility is very good, so we have high concentration and therefore small volume which can be nobilized. Right. Thank you, Efra, for a very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter is Dr. Karen Scheld from Case Western um, um, Reserve University. I will just slow your presentation. Please come up to the podium. Thank you so much. Let me just change this one. Yes. Thank you so much for introducing me. Um, and thank you so much for letting me present what we have done at Case Western Reserve University. Um, today I'm going to present a reporter system in mice where we can determine delivery and duration of genome edited or transplanted cells. And as you can see in the photo here, it's based on imaging and we will use both fluorescence and bioluminescence. And I have nothing to disclose. Yes, so we all know that cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. Um, it's also day three of the conference, so, so much so good. Um, so one of the best treatments for, um, for a genetic disorder would, of course, be to, to do gene editing. So this is an extremely simplified uh, drawing. We have a mutation in the genome. We want to go in and cut that out. And then we want to stitch in the corrected sequence. Um, this is, of course, very simplified um, because we do face a lot of challenges when we do gene editing. So first of all, we need high specificity. Uh, we need to be able to go in and um, correct the, the specific mutation we're talking about. We also need high efficiency. It's not enough to only uh, correct one cell. We need multiple cells. 
And then, of course, we need low toxicity. Um, if we go in and kill the cells that we correct or we kill the surrounding cells, it, it doesn't matter. Um, second of all, we need to be able to deliver our editing components to the appropriate cells in vivo. We also need to be able to uh, detect the, um, the fate of the edited cells. How long will they remain edited? Um, if we use uh, transplanted cells, if we edit trans uh, cells and then put them back into a mouse or patient, where will they then locate? Will they migrate through the body or what's, what's going on? So for all of this, we have come up with this reporter construct. So this is DNA. And we have these two reported genes. The first one is M. venus, uh, which is a fluorophore. It is a variant of green fluorescent protein that has been isolated from jellyfish. The second uh, reported gene is an enzyme, acaluciferase. It's a variant of luciferase uh, that has been isolated from fireflies. The substrate for um, acaluciferase is acalumen, and when it oxidizes acalumen, the reaction uh, emits light that we can detect. So upstream of these two reported genes, we have two LOX P sites uh, flanking these poly A sites. And the poly A is, of course, a, a transcriptional terminator. Upstream of this, we have a synthetic uh, CAD promoter, uh, so we can get expression of, of all of this. So in order for us to get expression of M. venus and acaluciferase, we need to add CRE, which is a recombinase that can recombine the two LOX P sites and thereby cut out the transcriptional terminators. And we will then get um, expression of M. venus and acaluciferase that we will be able to detect in microscopes or for bioluminescence. So first of all, we took our construct uh, and Cree and transfected wild-type fibroblasts uh, or fibroblasts from a wild-type mouse. And as you can see in the microscope here, uh, without Cree, we don't see any signal. But with Cree, we do see the M. venus signal. And as you can also see here, it's not all the cells that were transfected with both the reporter and the Cree. If we take the cells and look at the bioluminescence signal, we can see when we add Cree and the construct, we have almost 10 to the 8th um, as a detectable signal compared to uh, 10 to the third when we don't have Cree or construct. So also uh, look at this bar here, which are the cells with the construct but with no Cree. There's a tiny bit of leak through. Um, it's definitely higher than the background here. But what we should keep in mind is that the difference between the background level here and our true uh, signal is almost a thousandfold. Then we went ahead and took our uh, reporter construct and put it into a fertilized mouse egg. We put the egg into a female mouse and we created these flock stop reporter mice. Um, the purpose for these mice is that we will deliver Cree in different forms. It could be either DNA, so plasmid, mRNA or protein, and it can be different delivery pathways, so either subcutaneously, tail vein injections, um, what we, uh, yeah, what we want to try. The aim is then that Cree will go in and do the recombining of the LOX P sites and cut out the transcriptional terminators, so we will get a signal from maybe the whole mouse, so all cells, or if we use a targeted particle, maybe only a signal from a specific tissue, so the lung or maybe liver. We then took our flock stop reporter mouse um, and isolated a fibroblast from this mouse that we transfected with Cree. We can then take the cells and look in the microscope again. And as you can definitely see with the Cree, uh, we do see some signal. It's very faint compared to what we saw before with the where we transfect with the construct but please 
keep in mind that these cells only have two copies, whereas the others were transfected and had multiple copies. When we take these cells and look at the bioluminescence signal, uh, we definitely again see a pretty high signal, uh, more than 10 to the 6. And the background, again, is around 10 to the 4. So this, is, this difference is um, more than 100-fold. So as a control, we took our flock stop reporter mouse and crossed it with a mouse that expresses Cree in all tissues. So it has the CMV promoter up front. And we then got a mouse, like a positive control mouse, that has signal in all cells. We also went ahead and crossed our flock stop reporter mouse with a mouse that expresses Cree only in the intestinal epithelium. And we got a mouse that uh, only had the signal in the intestines. And when we look at them in the microscope of tissue sections, um, we can definitely see that here. If we look at the Mvenus signal uh, in the wild-type mouse, there's only the autofluorescent signal. In our positive control mouse, we see signal in the epithelial cells, but also in the underlying smooth muscle uh, layer. When we look at our intestinal mouse, um, we only see the signal in the epithelial cells. So also, what you can definitely see here, there is a difference in the signal uh, between epithelial cells and the smooth muscle cells. And keep in mind that this is a synthetic uh, promoter that should be equally expressed in all tissues, but apparently it is not. Um, we went ahead and did whole mouse imaging of the fluorescence. Um, and as you can again see here, muscles, uh, have a much higher signal compared to intestines and compared to liver. So, so different tissues uh, express, um, or something happens to the M-venous signal in different tissues. And this is uh, something we are still investigating. Then we uh, went ahead and looked at the different organs, different tissues. Uh, so this up here is fluorescence. The first half of this 24-well um, plate is uh, tissues from a wild-type mouse. The second half is from our positive control mouse. And down here you see the bioluminescence. Uh, so this is the exact same plate, but just scanning for bioluminescence. As you can see here on, in the graphs that shows the signal from the different tissues, uh, M-venous expression is highest in the uh, muscular, the femoral muscle. And that's the one down here. What is then puzzling us is that the bioluminescence does not correlate with the fluorescence. So the muscle down here does not have the highest signal when we look at bioluminescence. That is actually the lungs or the duodenum, as you can see over here in the graph. And this is again still something we are looking into, what, what happens to the proteins when they are expressed. But look at this beautiful picture of our uh, bioluminescence. These are the four different mice that I have been um, talking about. So our wild-type mouse with no signal, our flock stop reporter mouse, uh, so without Cree, also has no signal or very low signal. And then we have our intestinal mouse that only shows signal in the intestines. And then we have our positive control mouse with, cell, uh, with signal uh, all over the, the mouse. If we go in and look at the different regions, if we do some quantifications of the signal, um, I did like an abdominal region and a thoracic region to compare the signal. Um, then you can definitely see in the intestinal mouse here um, that there still is this 100-fold change. So if we go in and deliver Cree to our flock stop reporter uh, mice, we, if, and if we hit a full organ like the intestines and hit all the cells in the intestines, we will be able to detect that. But that is a lot of cells. Um, so the next step was for us to go in and, and actually see how many cells do we need to edit, um, to be able to detect them with this system. So we took our positive control mouse, uh, isolated fibroblasts from that one, 
and put them into the lungs of a wild type mouse. And we used our uh, mouse bronchoscope that delivers these cells very gently to the lungs. Yes, so this is the bioluminescent image of the study. Uh, the first mouse got 10 to the seventh cells into the lungs, the second 10 to the sixth, and 10 to the fifth, and then zero cells. And we can definitely see the difference between the thoracic region and the abdominal region when we give one million cells. And this is for live imaging studies, so no mice were sacrificed for this. If we then go ahead and sacrifice the mice and take out the, uh, the lungs, we are actually able to detect uh, down to 10 to the fifth um, cells compared to zero cells. We didn't do a lower dosage of cells, so I can't say if we're actually able to detect uh, even fewer cells that are edited. When we look at the fluorescence, so these are the exact same lungs, just looking at M. venus, we need at least 10 to the seventh uh, cells that are edited in order for us to see that signal. So fluorescence doesn't work with our um, imaging for this. It, it's more for a microscopy of, um, of tissue sections. Yes, so the next steps will be uh, to go in and compare the fluorescence and the bioluminescence from the different tissues and figure out what's going on. Um, then we wanna go in and test different uh, delivery strategies for our mice, so do different nanoparticle systems where we use Cree as the cargo. And I put my email address up here. So if you have a good nanoparticle in your lab, please, uh, please contact us so we can go ahead and try that. After we have delivered Cree, we wanna go in and see for how long um, can we have these uh, edited cells. And if we need to give multiple dosages, and then another step is uh, to go in and instead of using the, the Cree and the LOX-P upstream of our reported genes, then uh, use a small part of, for example, CFTR. And we have already started this part as well. Uh, so a small part of CFTR where we have inserted CF-specific stop mutations. Um, with this system, we can go in and test different um, editors and see if they can correct our stop mutation and then we can get the transcription of uh, M. venus and acolociferase and detect that. Yes, so thank you so much for listening and a lot of people went uh, help with the, all of this with the mice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we can take some questions now. I wanted to start by um, asking you a question. So, so um, first I wanted to say, uh, um, I hope you're ready to start scaling up because I have a feeling that a lot of people will be asking you uh, uh, to share this mice. Uh, um, this is beautiful work and will be very useful. Um, and I was one thing that I thought was really interesting that you alluded to is that sometimes you don't see um, super clear correlation between the phrase detection versus the fluorescent uh, protein detection. And that just made me think about, uh, uh, is, is there a way that you can use this uh, um, occasional discrepancy um, to better understand mechanisms of attenuation of fluorophore detection? Uh, for example, um, where different cell types have different cofactors that uh, um, M. venus may need for, 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 uh, uh, to detect your fluorescent protein? The easy answer would be probably, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Uh, um, for example, I thought, uh, um, have you looked at whether, so to take a step back, it looks like your signal to noise ratio is really great for the echolucifers detection, which makes me think that within at least the linear range of detection, I wonder whether you can use that as your denominator, let's say, to normalize um, your detection to then go and understand what's happening to your fluorescent protein. Uh, um, and, and, and does that, the discrepancy correlate with 
uh, um, factors that may be in different cell types uh, or, or uh, redox state that is often uh, known to affect autofluorescence and things like that. I'm not sure I understand completely what you're asking. Yep. I'll, uh, um, I'll talk to you a bit further <laughs> yes, later. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of a complex question, but... Uh, yes. Yep. It, it is complicated that we don't see the same signal uh, throughout the different tissues. Mm -hmm. And what we've talked about is many of the mice that we hear about in publications, they only look at different, like the, the target tissue. They don't look at the whole mouse. So mm -hmm. we don't know if, if this is what we see all the time or if mm -hmm. it's just us or what's going on. But there's definitely something going on that creates that difference. Yep. Thank you. We have a question. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. I have two quick questions, if I may. Do you, how good are antibodies to the AKA luciferase? And will you be able to look at um, single cells rather than you know, just a global image? Yes, we, we can definitely isolate uh, the tissue and isolate single cells. Um, the, the M venus and echo luciferase is expressed as a fusion protein, and we do have antibodies against M venus. We don't have any at the moment uh, against the uh, echo luciferase. Okay. And, and some of the next steps is also to go in and, and do Western blots and see in different tissues what is the level of, um, of, of the protein, that, the fusion mm -hmm. protein that's made. And my second question is related to delivery of gene therapy agents, plasmids, other things to the lung. I wondered if you have any plans to uh, cross your mouse with a better Enoch mouse? We don't, but that might be a question for our mouse core. <laughs> okay, thank you. So more, more of just a comment about the different expression levels throughout the body. I think it's known that Rosa 26 locus sometimes has different levels of expression in different tissues. Mm -hmm. The thing about antibodies in our experience with uh, EGFP expressing animals in formal and paraffin sections, we could get much more precise and intense uh, expression levels of the fluorescent protein with antibody staining than with endogenous fluorescence. Yes, yes. And, and also we need to make sure that we don't degrade the M venus protein uh, or, or the signal from it when we do the fixation and, and, and formalin. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I was just wondering, have you been able to detect the M venus signal using flow cytometry? Have you tried? Sorry, can I get that again? I'm, I'm looking for where you are. Hi, I'm <laughs> yes. back here. Yeah, I was just wondering if you've been able to detect the M venus signal using flow cytometry. Yes, we have tried some. Um, I've mostly done it on, on already single cell uh, suspension, so from blood cells or bone marrow cells. Um, and the expression is not that high. And I think that that tissue just does not express that much. Um, one of the tissues that we want to go more into is the muscle, um, which has an extremely high expression of M venus. So that would be our first uh, target. But no uh, uh, flow cytometry for that yet. Over here. Uh, two questions. One is dosage. Do you know how many molecules of Cre you need in order to flip the cell? And that may be important if you're delivering mRNA and you want to kind of get a sense of how efficient is the mRNA delivery. Second question is, once the M. venus and luciferase get turned on, is there an immune response in the animal against those proteins, since theoretically the animal has never seen those proteins until Cree was administered? Yes, so we, haven't, we have some pretty old of our positive control mice that were um, crossed with Cree uh, all throughout the body. Um, and they seem fine. We have some that are two years old. Um, and they grow fine and they breed and everything. So I don't think there is anything uh, for that. But that is a good question because the immune response has not seen M. venus or echolociferase before. Um, and your first question. Yeah, that, that, 
I can't answer that question. <laughs> that would be uh, someone from my lab. <laughs> very, very little Cree is required. And to your, your question about um, immune response, uh, I think as we're finding these things um, are leaky, and so they've probably already been exposed to the antigen early during development. Beautiful presentation. Uh, some people are claiming that in certain cell lines, CMV's promoter turn off over time. Did you see different level of expression in function of the age of your mice in your system and in different tissues over time? That is actually a good comment. Um, we haven't looked specifically at different ages of the mice, but that could be something we could go in and see. The mice we have scanned so far um, all show high signal, but that has been like a whole body signal. Um, and that has been consistent with all the mice we have seen so far, um, different ages. But we haven't done uh, like different organs, tissue specific scans, um, but that could be something we could go into. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for a great presentation. Next up, we will have Kate Excoffon um, from Spirevant. I am going to put on a laser pointer here, too. So, um, Thank you to the organizers and thank you to everybody who's still here listening to the talks right up to the very end. It's a great pleasure to present our delivery of SP101 restores CFTR function in human CF airway epithelial cultures and drives human CFTR delta R transgene expression in the airways of ferrets. And my disclosure, I'm a VP of research at Spirevent Sciences and the other authors also are uh, employed by Spirevent Sciences. And so it's a really great honor to be able to present to you today about SP101, which is a novel inhaled adeno-associated virus or AAV-based gene therapy designed specifically to treat cystic fibrosis. So our major design features is an AAV capsid that was selected for tropism to the apical surface of human airway epithelia using a directed evolution approach. Inside of that capsid in the genome, we have the human CFTR delta R mini gene, which is a shortened version of human CFTR that contains a small deletion of the R domain, but still retains full function as well as regulation like wild type CFTR. It also contains the re regulatory elements, the promoter and poly A in order to ensure uh, promotion and, um, and termination of this. Our proposed clinical route of administration is via oral inhalation of an aerosol, first of SP101, followed by a small molecule called doxorubicin. And our believed mechanism of action is that SP101 has very high affinity to the apical surface or the air surface upon inhalation of this vector and is able to bind and efficiently enter into airway epithelia. Once in the cell, what has been shown previously is that doxorubicin is able to act as a proteasomal inhibitor in order to enhance not just our AAV but general AAVs to get to the nucleus and be able to then produce the RNA, and in our case, the human CFTR delta R RNA, which then can be translated in the cytoplasm into the human CFTR delta R protein for functional correction of CF airway. So the first question is always, is it functional? And so I have presented some of this data previously, but in this study, now we have this across five different donors. And this particular data I'm showing you is in primary human airway epithelia from uh, donors with class one mutations. So those are mutations with stop codons and do not produce the full length protein. 
The report, the vector was put, SP-101 was put on the apical surface and doxorubicin on the basal surface overnight and then removed and a week later, we looked for chloride currents, so CFTR function via oozing chamber assay. And so on the y-axis, we have the peak uh, short circuit current and on the x-axis is what the epithelia were treated with. And in this case, because these epithelia have stop codons, the vertex triple modulators as our positive control were unable to restore any function in these epithelia. By contrast, SP101 with doxorubicin, even at a low MOIs of 500, but also at 5,000 and 100,000, were able to uh, improve the, the chloride transport to the levels of our non-CF control. Um, what is striking also about this data, not only do we see a dose response, but we also see the importance of doxorubicin in being able to mediate this expression. So in the absence of doxorubicin, there is very little to no chloride currents. Um, in poster 672, and I know the poster sessions are done, but you can still go look at the poster, uh, we show some really beautiful data that correlates vector genomes. So SP101 is mediating vector entry, and the doxorubicin is really then improving the RNA expression, which leads to the, the protein function. So I encourage you to go look at our poster. So what about tropism? Everybody's interested in tropism. <laughs> and it seems everybody's choice of what cells is, is, is changing over time. In this experiment, and, and thanks to Scott Randell and his group at Spirovation, primary human CF airway epithelia, in this case, they were homozygous for delta F mutations, were treated with an SP101 capsid containing the M cherry reporter gene and again in the presence of doxorubicin. And seven days later, cells were fixed and five color immunostaining and confocal microscopy was performed. And so I know these, these combined images are a lot to look at, so we separated them out. And I first want you to look at this yellow staining here, which is representative of our M cherry staining. And what you can see is this hits a large number of these cells, so 30 to 40% of the cells were positive for it. The question was then, what cell types were, were they hitting? And in this case, we stained also the cells for down here on the bottom, alpha tubulin, which represents ciliated cells in the white, and MUC5AC, which represents the secretory cells. And on the XZ image here, even though it's difficult to see, I've pointed out some of the cells that are, are also stained for M. cherry, and there were ciliated, non-ciliated cells, as well as these basal-like cells that were stained for the M. cherry. Um, many of the cell types were actually non-ciliated and potentially were secretory cells. So that just highlights this vector tropism is, is rather broad in the cells. And by contrast, in our control cells, you can see the M cherry absence of M, M cherry staining, indicating that this staining is specific. So the next question is, does it work in animals? And uh, we chose ferret as our model to evaluate inhaled SP101. One of the major things is that these were selected on human airway cells. And it turns out that it is also tropic to ferret airway cells. In doing these kind of directed evolution experiments, that's become a, a big theme to make sure that you still have a model that you can study your vector in. Additionally, the ferret has a CF model that recapitulates human CF lung pathology. And we worked with John Englehart to be able to also look at our vector in CF animals. And finally, and very importantly, for, for moving studies forward to translation, there has to be the ability to administer the vector in a similar manner to what you would adm administer it for humans. And so via inhalation, ferrets were administered first SP101, followed by doxorubicin. And two weeks later, or at the end of, the end of our study, at uh, three months, we performed both in situ hybridization as well as looking for human CFTR mRNA expression, which is what I'm going to show in this presentation. And so 
I think we were probably all very impressed by 4D molecular therapeutics data earlier about the impressive in situ hybridization. And in our ferrets also, each of one of these, the, first the ferrets were given SP101 followed by doxorubicin and this in situ hybridization was two weeks later. Each of one of these red dots represents a vector genome. And we have bronchial region represented here as well as alveolar region. And I hope what you can appreciate is that there's a lot of these red dots that are, that are present in a lot of different cell types here. Bless you. And that is in contrast to our control, which was a DNA's control uh, where you can see no staining indicating the, the um, specificity of this probe for a vector. So next is what what does that then translate into in an animal model? And so again, in these animals, delivered SP101 followed by doxorubicin, multiple regions of the airway were dissected out two weeks or in the next slide, 12 weeks later. And these data, I've previously shown some of this data, these are extension of our non-clinical studies. And um, in our control animals, there's no expression of the mRNA, as you would expect, and no, on the x-axis, we've got the human CFTR delta R mRNA copies per microgram RNA on a log scale. In our control animals, there's no copies. If you just put SP101 into the animals, no doxorubicin, you do see some expression in those animals. However, if you add on doxorubicin, there's a significant greater than tenfold, about a 17-fold increase in the amount of mRNA expression. And this amount of mRNA expression is very similar to endogenous CFTR, or endogenous CFTR in the ferrets. So what about longevity? Because it's we uh, have heard many times now in this conference, we don't know how long our airway cells are gonna last, so we don't know how long AAV, which is a non-integrating vector, would last. But we were excited to see that at the end of our study, at 12 weeks, we were able to see very similar levels of mRNA for this vector. And again, in the same uh, 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 level of endogenous uh, ferret CFTR. So the next question, and, and I have presented this data previously in a previous study, but one of the most important things is what happens in the CF ferret. Can you make it through the mucus and everything else that's in these lungs of these ferrets? And so CF and non-CF ferrets were administered SP101 followed by, do by doxorubicin, and two weeks later multiple regions were dissected out in order to look at the expression. And in our control animals, both CF and non-CF, they were uh, below the level of quantification, um, detection of the RNA, and we were very pleased to see that both the CF and the non-CF animals had very similar levels of human CFTR delta R mRNA expression. So very exciting to think that the, the CF lung doesn't, and the mucus that's there doesn't hold a barrier to our vector and, and transfer. So in summaries, SP101 holds great promise for people living with CF. What I've shown you is that CF, SP101 is able to functionally correct CF human airway epithelia very robustly. Doxorubicin is required for that efficient correction by SP101. It's tropic to many different human airway epithelial cell types as well as ferret epithelial cell types. Human CFTR delta R expression and CF correction are dose responsive, durable, and reach levels similar to endogenous ferret. And of great importance, the human CFTR delta R mRNA expression is similar in CF and wild type ferrets, suggesting that the CF airway is not an additional barrier to SP101 transduction. So finally, the acknowledgements, we want to acknowledge the assistance of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation as well as Lovelace, um, the University of Iowa, and Spirovation in assisting us with these studies as well as a large number of people at Spirovance. And if you want more information, I'm happy to answer questions now, but if you want to go back and look at this data, please, please take a look at our posters. Thank you, Kate. Maybe if I could ask the first question while our mic runners are going. Um, so you showed some really impressive um, expression data. And I was just curious because 
a kind of known problem with AAVs is potentially partial cargo. And so I was wondering if when you looked at your mRNA, if you knew that it was full length or if you were targeting kind of the three prime end of CFTR. That's a great question. So our uh, PCR assay is designed to the three prime end of the vector. So if, uh, if, if it's there, my expectation is that we, that's what we're detecting. We did not look to see with other primer probe sets if we were detecting um, truncated forms also, but um, what I'm showing here should be full length. Yeah, thank you. That's definitely encouraging because you have a promoter presumably, and if you're detecting the three prime end, that's yeah. definitely encouraging for full length. Thank you. Steve. Stephen Orr, thanks for sharing. Have you seen the the tissue tissue distribution in the in the ferret study, and then subsequently the cell type uh, analysis, much in the way that you showed in the HBE in the ferret? So, are you talking about ferret airway cultures, or are you talking about just in the ferret lungs? In the ferret lungs. So um, what I've shown you is a representative example of what we've looked at. We see um, we haven't done a cell by cell analysis, but basically it's everywhere. So much like 4D showed great success, 40% of the cells being positive were in that range also in the ferret, which is encouraging because this vector was designed or selected to be able to be tropic to humans. So we're very optimistic. I think we're going to take an online question real quick before we go back to in-person questions. Um, our online question, Kate, is with the use of doxorubicin, did you see any impact on the heart or susceptibility to infection in the ferret? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question because doxorubicin is a chemotherapeutic drug and uh, that was of concern. What we've seen is um, we're actually at very low levels. It's, it's way, way below what a human, anybody with cancer would be getting. And so at these very low levels of doxorubicin, it looks to be very safe and uh, allows us to continue with the development of this product. So it looks really encouraging. Thanks very much for sharing those data. I uh, wonder, with your mini gene, what, what is the size of your transgene? And just a follow-up question, what serotype of AAV was used in the study? Yeah, so so first the serotype is AAV 2.5T that, that I discovered many years ago. The references are there if you want to go take a look. And um, the delta R deletes um, a region, so it's about 4,300 nucleotides in the range of that. It was just enough to be able to put our shortened promoter and the poly A and be able to have very efficient packaging for production purposes. Do you know if, if your um, access to the basal cells from the apical side is, is transcytosis or is it paracellular leak of the virus? That's a great question. And we have not done those studies, but of course others have looked at it with uh, other AAVs that there is the potential for transcytosis and um, our epithelia, what we know and what I didn't show here in these studies, it, it is in our poster. Um, they retain very strong tight junctions. They don't change, there doesn't seem to be any toxicity. So I would be surprised if it was leak. Uh, Tom Lynch from Iowa. Uh, has anybody looked at if the if the delta R variant that you're expressing in the in the vector actually responds to trichafta? I don't know if that's a practical thing to to think about, but our our expectation is it would respond to trichafta. Um, I, wild type CFTR often I don't know many of those studies that people put it on wild type, but it seems to not make a problem, or at least not have a problem with it. So um, if your question is, if we get low expression, would Trikaf to be able to boost it further? That's a great question. We haven't done those studies, but, but it would be exciting if you could. Thank you for a great talk, Kate. Um, two quick questions, if I may. Can you tell us what type of in situ hybridization you used? Was it RNA scope or HCR or? Something different? Yep, this was RNA scope that we were using. Thank you. And my second question, which I might have missed, what was the dose you used in the ferrets, and how are you going to work up the dose that you might be using in human based on the ferret transduction efficiency? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Anybody actually doing these studies knows how complicated it is because there's really two doses. There's what goes into the nebulizer and then what's deposited into the animal. And what's deposited into the animal is always a, a calculation and estimation. And the estimation is that in, in the, the new studies that we were doing, it's about e to the 12 vector genomes per, per gram long weight um, in that range. Um, the, the final data slide that you showed, that there was no difference between the CF and the non-CF, but the error bars were quite big, which suggests at least one of the animals didn't respond. Have you characterized that animal in more detail? So it's, it's actually not that one of the animals didn't respond. It's that we took multiple different regions. So we had nine different regions that we took tissues from. And with any gene therapy, there's just variability depending on where you pick the tissues. And so we had a lot of discussions about how to do this. The idea that I call it the John Englehart way of, of taking the whole lung and homogenizing the whole thing as, about, as opposed to understanding some of the regional differences. And within an animal, there could be a region that was very, very positive and a region that was very low in expression. And so that's actually not reflecting an animal that had very low expression as much as one of the regions had low expression. Okay, thank you. Kate, I've got another online question for you. Um, what is the impact of dosing docs alone in your preclinical data? Does it affect any level of your data set? So docs alone? Uh, we do not expect there to be any issue. Um, the, we haven't seen anything that would uh, preclude us from going f forward with it, but DOCS plus SP101 is what we expect to give the real functional activity. Oh, so, great, thank you. Thanks, great. Thank you for your presentation. Can you share how you did the directed evolution in what animal species to discover this vector? Yeah, so that work actually was published a long time ago, back in 2009, and we used um, primary human airway epithelia. And it was uh, back before directed evolution was a big thing. And so it was using a, a library that was shuffled as well as mutagenized. There was no peptide in here. So we ended up with a hybrid between AAV2 and AAV5 plus an additional mutation just something that you would never be able to rationally design and think it would work this great. Thank you. We'll, we'll do one more question, right. Scott. So as thrilled as I am about the <laughs> high levels of transduction in the ALI cultures, 30 to 40 percent is fabulous. I, I think the elephant in the room is doxorubicin. And even though you give a much lower dose, if you think about it, if it's by inhalation, it's administered to the lung, it's might clear into the terminal airways. You know, this is like where adenocarcinoma comes from and the mechanisms of DOX toxicity include oxygen radical generation and topoisomerase and all of that. I, you know, I just wonder what the thought is moving forward with yeah. that. So, so it's, it's a great comment, and to shrink that elephant, elephant in the room, um, we give a single dose of doxorubicin that's way below what the clinical doses are, and in fact, people who with cancer who have been treated very extensively with very high levels of doxorubicin for a very long time, and then recover from their you know, cancer, uh, they do not have higher levels of cancer subsequent cancer after doxorubicin treatment, mm. um, and, and they're getting much, much more than what we're proposing. So I, I actually, you know, I recognize and, and absolutely accept that there is a risk there, but um, the data from people with cancer, so cancer survivors, doesn't mm. suggest that this is going to be a, a, a huge barrier. Thank you. Awesome. Let's thank Kate again. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Katarina Kulhankova from the University of Iowa. And I activated a laser pointer, in case you need it. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work on the peptide-mediated delivery of adenine-based editors to the rhesus monkey airway epithelium. 
as we uh, all know, there is approximately 10% of uh, CF uh, population that is either not responsive to the medications, uh, most recent medications, or they have contraindications or side effects that prevent application of these uh, very helpful medications to them. One of the main goals on our laboratory is to advance the research on the possible treatments for these individuals who uh, carry most often class one mutations uh, that prevent the generation of the functional CF protein, CFTI protein. We focus on adenine-based editors. Among almost uh, 401 CF-causing genetic variants, there is about 66% that, uh, that have point mutations. Among these point mutations, there is about 46% that can be potentially corrected with adenine-based editors, and around 15% that could be corrected with cytosine-based editors. Adenine-based editors are gene editing systems that mediate an enzymatic conversion from AT-based pair to GC-based pair. And they have several advantages, one of them being Cas9 nickase that is uh, modified to, do not to not to cause double-stranded breaks, but only single-stranded nick. These base editors are, uh, uh, these base editors cause a precise single nucleotide base change and cause, uh, uh, they have great efficiency in non-dividing and slowly dividing cells as uh, are in, in the airways. They have time-limited time limited activity and cause minimum bystander effects. We have previously uh, looked at the human, uh, at, at the human mutant, um, at the human cells with mutation R553X, and uh, using the adenine-based editors, we're able to edit the pathogenic uh, allele. For this, we use adenine-based editor 7.10 and delivery by electroporation. We delivered the uh, base editors to primary cells that were grown at air liquid interface. And compared to mock, mock electroporated cells, we documented desired base change at, in 77.2% of the cells. Because this was a compound heterozygous uh, donor, uh, the efficient allelic efficiency, editing efficiency was 54%. And importantly, in functional oozing assay, this proved to be uh, a, a sufficient editing, allelic editing, to result in a partial correction of CFDR function. We documented this not only in donor, uh, in the cells from this particular donor, but also uh, in a donor with W1282X mutation, and in a cell line with R553X mutation. However, using electroporation, we realized this is not a feasible methodology to uh, deliver to, human, to humans, and a major challenge uh, in delivery is, of course, how to overcome the barrier represented by uh, numerous layers of the airway epithelia and airway epithelial resistance to any delivery itself. For this purpose, we teamed up with Feldan Therapeutics and uh, designed amphiphilic peptides as a strategy for protein delivery to airway epithelium. Amphiphilic peptides consist between, of between 24 to 34 or 40 uh, amino acids and consist of two domains, one of them being N-terminal endosomal leakage domain that consists mostly of hydrophobic amino acids, and its role is to bind and destabilize lipid membranes. The other uh, domain is C-terminal cell-penetrating domain. It is hydrophilic, positively charged, con consisting of positively charged amino acids, and mediates primarily internalization to the cells. These two domains are connected with a GS-rich linker. In this schematic, the um, amphiphilic peptide, call also, called also Feldan shuttle, is depicted by blue circles, and the cargo it is carrying into the cells is a green fluorescent protein with nuclear localization signal. The uh, peptide binds to the membrane of the cells and um, binds to the, uh, to the membrane of the cells, causes destabilization of the membrane uh, and uh, uptake into the, of the GFP of the cargo to the endosomes. 
Again, uh, peptide causes destabilization of endosomal membrane and release of the GFB to the cytoplasm. This process occurs rapidly. Within 45 seconds, GFB is observed in the cytoplasm, and within two minutes, GFB is uh, localizing into the nuclei of the cells. After that, the shuttle stays bound to the, to the uh, cellular membranes, endosomal membranes, and undergoes degradation. In 24 hours, there is no evidence of the shuttle being present. This methodology is relatively simple, uh, fast, and as we documented, at the uh, concentrations uh, effective in this system, non-toxic. We wanted to document whether this shuttle peptide can deliver proteins to the airways epithelia, not only in vitro, but also in vivo. So for this purpose, use shuttle peptide S10 and uh, as a cargo GFP uh, with nuclear localization signal or sci-fi labeled peptide with nuclear localization signal. We combined these uh, shuttle peptide with a cargo uh, in a solution and applied it to the human airway epithelia grown at ALI. And within 15 minutes, we could document the cargo, in this case GFP, being present in the ciliated cells in the upper panel and in MAC5 AC positive cells in the lower panel. In an animal experiment, we delivered a uh, shuttle peptide combined with sci-fi analysis uh, to the mice intranasally, and after one hour, uh, we uh, collected the tissues and looked by microscopy at the distribution of the sci-fi in the airways. We could see that sci-fi sci was efficiently delivered to small airways, large airways, and also uh, found it in alveolar regions. So our next question was whether this shuttle peptide can, can be used for delivery of editors such as CRISPR-Cas9 RNPs to airway epithelia. And for this, uh, we used the ROSA MTMG mice that ubiquitously express red fluorescent protein throughout their tissues. Upon successful, ed uh, successful editing with Cas9 RNP, the MT cassette is excised and MG cassette is expressed, so the positive uh, editing is uh, displayed by green uh, expression of green fluorescent protein in the cells. We quantify that large airways and uh, small airways expressed between 13 and uh, 11 to 13 percent of the green cells, so this would be our editing efficiency achieved by using this methodology. The question was whether we could use this system and deliver uh, adenine-based editors to the airways of human, non-human primates, and what would be the editing efficiency we would be able to achieve. For this, we chose um, two experiments. In the first experiment, we delivered um, sci-fi NLS localization signal, sci-fi labeled peptide, mixed with our S10 peptide by intratracheal aerosolization, and after two hours, we collected the tissues for microscopy and also collected airway brushings for NGS, that would be a negative control for our next experiment. Using this method, we examined the biodistribution of the fluorescent peptide in the airways and in, in uh, different epithelial cell subtypes. In the second experiment, we proceeded with shuttle peptide delivery of IB RNPs, and again, we aerosolized one milliliter of uh, the solution to the, airway, to the, to the rhesus uh, trachea. And after seven days, we collected the lungs and performed airway brushings from various regions of the lungs to examine the editing efficiency uh, by NGS. We also collected additional clinical variables and also performed chest CT, and post procedure. By microscopy, in the first experiment, we identified that sci fi localized into the cells throughout the respiratory tract uh, in trachea, large airways, medium sized airways, small airways, but also uh, very richly in alveolar regions of the lungs. In comparison, our control uh, animal that received sci fi alone without the shuttle peptide, we did not observe lo nuclear localization of the sci fi. By, um, if, if we would like to express what the percentage of the sci-fi positive cells we observed, in the large airways it was about 15%, and in the small airways uh, it was about 5%. 
When we looked at various subtypes of uh, the cells where we were able to deliver this uh, reporter peptide, um, we could see uh, nuclear localization in ciliated cells that are labeled with the red acetylated tubulin antibody, and in secretory cells that are depicted by green granules. In alveolar regions, we observed sci-fi nuclear localizing in alveolar type 2 cells, but we also observed a sci-fi, this, this time cytoplasmic in macrophages, uh, and uh, this finding actually underscores one of the properties of the shuttle peptides that were designed to specifically deliver the cargo into the epithelial cells rather than any other cell types in the lungs. I apologize for the formatting changes that, uh, that are occurring right now. So uh, before we proceeded to administering adenine-based editors uh, into the resource airways, um, we decided to uh, perform a few in vitro experiments. And for these ex experiments, uh, we chose CCR5 locus and editing within this locus uh, as a safe harbor. So by the red letter, we denoted uh, our target uh, nucleotide that after editing uh, changes to G with um, C on the, uh, on the contrast strand. We applied ABE, AE, RNBs mixed with the shuttle uh, variants in this case uh, at the resource airway epithelia ground at ALI and uh, selected two shuttle peptides that for the future in vivo experiments. We documented that parental S10 peptide had editing efficiency around 5% and a further developed S315 shuttle peptide had much, be much better delivery properties and uh, resulted in editing frequency around 9%. So we are proceeding with the second experiment, administering this, uh, this solution uh, with AB, RNB to the rhesus monkeys after seven days obtaining brushings from various regions of the lungs, uh, including trachea, both uh, left and right mainstem bronchi and uh, sub large segmental airways. We also chose one uh, distal location uh, that would be left lower lobe subsegmental airway. On airway brushings that we obtained, we documented types of the cells that we are collecting, ciliated and non-ciliated cells. In our NGS analysis, we documented that appropriately the controls that we used, in this case, the control monkey from the first experiment, and then in the second experiment, RNP alone, or RNP administered with S10 peptide did not result in significant editing. But the two subjects that were administered, uh, adenine space editor with S315 shuttle peptide, uh, documented great amount of editing that ranged from 0.2 to 5.3 percent, depending on the regional uh, regional uh, location of the brushing. We proceeded with translational application of this approach, and uh, for this we chose donor patient donor cells with compound heterozygous mutation R553X and L571X. The cells were grown at air liquid interface and we administered the shuttle peptide either S10 or 315 uh, with adenine based editor RNBs. We documented by NGS that both of these shuttles were effective in uh, successfully mediating the base editing uh, with, with this uh, base editor. With RNP, RNP S10, we documented the mean editing efficiency about 2% and using the S315 shuttle peptide, this editing was uh, about 5%. Importantly, in functional assay in oozing chambers, both of these shuttles are documented to be effective in mediating the uh, adenine-based uh, editor editing uh, that resulted in partial functional restoration of CFDR current. In conclusion, the shuttle peptide successfully delivered AB RNBs in the non-human primate model into the airway epithelia in vivo. We achieved up to 5.3% editing efficiency at CCR5 locus, and delivery occurred primarily to ciliated and secretory cells in the airway epithelia, for which we used a surrogate marker of sci-fi. 
In human airway epithelia in vitro, we documented the shuttle peptides were successful in, the, in delivering AB RNPs uh, to the cells and uh, achieving the editing efficiency up to 6%, editing our 553X locus, and resulting in a partial functional correction of CF CFDR function. In the future, we would like to focus more on translational applications in human airway epithelia with uh, other, non, uh, other nonsense mutations, and also using this approach in CF animal models. We would like to examine the effect of repeated administration on uh, editing efficiency, and of course also on safety and toxicity. With this, I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Paul McRae, from the University of Iowa Sumba Traore and a team of other collaborators. From Feldon Therapeutics, David Gee, Stephanie Halle, Anna Shu Cheng, and a number of other individuals. From Broad Institute and David Liu's lab, I would like to thank Greg Newby, and from the Non-Human Primate Testing Center in California, Dr. Terental and her testing team and of course our, uh, fund, our funding sources. And um, thank you for your attention and I would be happy to take your questions. Okay, we are ready for some questions and um, while the audience gets the microphone, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Dr. Kulhankova, um, what is known about the ray limiting step um, for um, delivery using this shuttle um, and is this something you can kind of like rationally design your, your shuttle modifications to overcome that step? Right, so uh, each shuttle is specifically designed for a, a guide RNA that delivers efficiently. So there is um, modifications that could be applied to make each shuttle very specific for the mutation and the location within the genome that you want to target. So I would say that is a rate limiting step there. Optimization of this. Thank you, Steve Rowe. Thank you very much. The the um, I have a question about the rhesus delivery study with the Sci Five reporter, and you, you noted that the small airway delivery was what five percent versus twenty percent in the trachea, if I remember correctly. So, I'm wondering, is this a matter of the respiratory delivery that you think you were achieving, or is there something native about the small airway cells that may or may not be Different in terms of their propensity to uptake and or edit with the, with with the Philbin shuttle RB. I would uh, say that this uh, this difference in editing or, or in sci-fi positive cells that we observed. Um, are you talking about editing or uh, the sci-fi delivery? I was talking about the sci-fi part. Sci-fi. Uh, I would say that the difference that we see may reflect the fact that we are aerosolizing the solution into, in, in the trachea, in the upper trachea, and using an atomizer device that perhaps creates larger particles than are able to enter the small airways. So uh, I would say it partially it may be a factor of, uh, of, of this mechanical um, aerosolization or administration method. and. Um, whether this would be different if we use nebulizer, I think that's something that we could potentially look into. And then I take it in the modifications that you're making, are you altering the affinity with the, the Cas9 mRNA complexes that you're using? Uh, the modifications that are done to the shuttle peptides include the changes to the overall charge or the charges of the, ter of the termino terminus and terminus and C-terminus. So that would definitely influence the uh, interaction with the Cas9, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, my, my question is related to, to Steve's last question, which is in your diagram, you kind of show that the, the peptides bind to the membrane. Yes. and create an endosoma-like vesicle, which then almost acts like bulk uptake of the extracellular fluid, which contains the vector, your RNP or your Psi-5. Right. They're not physically attached, though, that I understand. So yes. do other things in the extracellular milieu get taken up in these vesicles? In the case of a CF lung, there might be bacteria mm -hmm. or cytokines or other kinds of things in the extracellular space you might not want to get into the cytosol. How selective is that uptake of what gets in through the shuttle mechanism? Yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, any 
any substance that is found in the extracellular space will be taken up in these endosomes. So, uh, yes. Hi. Um, there's a load of really nice data there. My question um, re relates to the cells that you can uh, transduce or you can deliver the uh, base editor to. You've shown very nicely that you've got surface epithelial cells. Do you ever reach basal cells or could you modify the peptide delivery system in any way to reach the basal cells? That modification would be certainly desired, and I'm sure the company is working on that as well. What we observed in our study, uh, we could find sci-fi localizing in occasional KRT5 positive, positive basal cells. Um, it was not as robust as seeing the sci-fi in other cell types. So yes, it, it was present in a very small degree. Thank you. Thank you. Katerina, I have an online question for you. Yep. Uh, very interesting talk. I was wondering if your shuttle peptides were compatible with mRNA delivery, and if so, what is the cargo size limit? So uh, since the peptide do not really engulf the cargo or anyhow call, create any kind of delivery vehicle, vesicle, uh, the size is not uh, a concern. So this would be applicable in mRNA, mRNA delivery as well. Thank you. Very nice presentation. A question for you is, what do you know or anticipate about the immune response to the delivery of the shuttle peptides, as well as the adenine, adenine base editor? But I'm focused mainly on the, the shuttle peptide. So these studies are currently under, undergoing in our collaborating lab. Uh, preliminary data suggests that there is no immune response to the shuttle peptides, but this is still under investigation. In the mouse studies that were that are presented and that were published before, we looked at the immune responses one week after delivery, within one week uh, period after delivery, and there was a slight increase of primarily anti-inflammatory mediators. One day that decreased rapidly the second day, so we don't anticipate these uh, shuttle peptides being pro-inflammatory or immune-inducing, uh, immune response-inducing. Thank you. Are there any more audience questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. So just to wrap up, I wanna thank all of you for staying for the very last session. I hope you'll agree that we had some really excellent talks, um, some very thought-provoking data, and some really encouraging preclinical data across several different types of genetic therapies. Um, also, you know, the theme of this conference is back together, and I think one of the nice things about being back together is in-person questions. So if we could also give a quick round of applause to our mic runners, Lon and Justin. <laughs> yeah, so thank you again um, to our presenters and to all of you for your attention. Thank you, and we'll see you at the closing event.